think I want to immediately dive into the deep end of the pool. Um, I know, having spoken to you on other occasions, you're both of the opinion that Arthur Miller is the greatest American dramatist. But I want to unpack what, I want to unpack what that means. Uh, starting with, other than the accident of birth, yes, he was born in the United States, what does it mean to be an American dramatist? Why is Miller particularly an American dramatist in terms of his his, his interests, his predilections, his themes, his whatever. Let's, let's begin there. I can start. I mean, I've, I've been thinking about this question, obviously, a lot this centennial year. And, uh, and I love the anecdote from, from England where they were talking about the, you know, how they viewed Miller as a playwright in England. And it was like, um, you know, obviously Shakespeare's at the top, then there's Miller, then there's God. <laughs> And it made me think, you know, Miller is up there with Shakespeare. He really is. I think he's the American Shakespeare. Um, and American, I think, partly because of the difference between him and Shakespeare. I mean, I've kind of whittled down Shakespeare to everything in, in, uh, in Shakespeare play. To me, is this huge conflict between these, the dueling motivations of love and honor. And it, honor tends to make Shakespearean heroes do strange, crazy, self-destructive things which sort of leads them away from the love that is the real way to live, and a way to love yourself and to love other people, too. Uh, Miller, slight twist on that, because he's an American, and, and he's been with American concerns. And let's face it, honor isn't really, you don't hear a lot of that in, in American circles. What Miller is dealing with is the conflict between love and success, it seems to me. And he's doing the same thing that Shakespeare does, where you know, the try for success leads us all to do crazy, self-destructive things. But if we could learn the lessons to you know, embrace the more loving side, to love both ourselves and others, we could create a better society, which is, I think, was always Miller's hope. And his hope was to do that in an American democracy. He very strongly believed in the idea of democracy. That, that's what, to me, makes him American. Stephen, you have anything to add? Yeah, uh, for me, uh, Miller is the quintessential American playwright because he's so uh, welcomed uh, on, on the world stage. Uh, when I talk about the Mount Rushmore of American playwrights, I'm going to apologize to the uh, Eugene O'Neill and it would all be Tennessee Williams people in the crowd. But for me, uh, Miller belongs up there with them, obviously. But he, I think he's different than they are, even though they all deal with, with, deal with subjects that are quintessentially American, the American ideal, the struggle for how we live uh, in America. Miller is greeted on the world stage, I think, uh, because of, uh, of his interest in society. Uh, where those, uh, where he, he explores for us how our personal struggles, our family struggles, cross into what goes on in society. And that's why he has a great interest uh, uh, for, for European audiences, particularly English audiences as well. Mm -hmm. While we're on the subject of geography, if that's particularly what makes him American, uh, he's also thought of as a kind of, in a way, quintessential Brooklyn writer. Yes, he is. How does uh, Brooklyn loom large in the imagination when talking about or thinking about Miller? Uh, Miller spent his first uh, 13 years living in, in upper middle class splendor in Manhattan. And when his father uh, got into business trouble in 1928, and then of course when the crash came, the family had to move to 1928 uh, in, in, to Brooklyn. And Miller found the Brooklyn air, just beautiful. Uh, for Miller, going to Brooklyn, we think of Brooklyn as being a city now, obviously, uh, but Brooklyn in 1928 was, as Miller described, like going to the country. It must be exactly what it was like. Yeah. There's actually an echo of that in the play when Absolutely. Dr. Hyman talks about riding down, I forget the parkway. Exactly, I've been down that parkway, if you want to come yeah. to Brooklyn, I'll take you on that tour, yes. When, when Dr. Hyman rode down Ocean Parkway uh, in those years, at, at one time Ocean Parkway had a bridal path. You could literally drive from one of some, you guys can recognize it, all the way down to the beach uh, in Coney Island. You can do that. And so when Miller got to Brooklyn, that became his lifelong subject to me as that struggle between uh, the world of the city and the world of the country. And that's the thing we see in Willie Loman. Willie Loman, longing for the pastoral past. Of, of Brooklyn, all of us longing for the pastoral past of America, and how do we live that out, or has it been destroyed uh, by the city? So you see that definitely in Broken Glass, which of course takes place in the very place as well. We're all trying to get back to Eden. <laughs> yes. Well, for a writer, Miss uh, Sue is saying it's interested in this, you know, conflict between love and success, and there's a, obviously a cult of success in the United States in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, Brooklyn or New York City is, is in a way the cauldron of that, right? It's the place that you come from across the ocean or elsewhere in America to, to make something of yourself. Yeah, that, that's another thing I think that makes, uh, that is particularly American about Miller, the, the, the fascination of identity runs through all his work, this idea, because I think that is a very American concern, because everyone, everyone in America, you can tell from my accent, everyone from America is from somewhere else, and it's like we're trying to find who we are once we get here, and that's something I think Miller explores in all of his plays, in all of his characters at some point, in every play, there's, there's a, in one of the main characters will see something about, you know, I'm trying to find myself, or I don't really know who I am, and that seems to be a very uh, a strong impetus in his work. Yeah, and in Broken Glass, obviously, uh, Philip is, is a self-loathing Jew, and he's trying to find his identity as a Jew, as a husband, uh, as a father, as a businessman. Sylvia, trying to just find her place as a, as a woman, as a Jewish woman. And she, yeah, she says, this is a Jewish woman. That's her moment in this play. Is this question, I mean, you're talking about this search for identity or the struggle with identity, is it as warping an experience for other Miller protagonists as it is for uh, for Gelber? I mean, obviously for him, it, it, it completely contorts his whole life. In those first, in those first four plays that he wrote, the great plays, All My Sons, Death of a Salesman, The Crucible, and View from the Bridge, uh, those are masterpieces. He wrote them all in a row, and every one of those characters is crying out for his identity, struggling with his identity. When Give Willie me Loman, my name! Yeah, when, when, when <laughs> Willie Loman says, I am Willie Loman. You are Biff Loman. Their names give them an identity. John Crockett in the Crucible, when he rips up his confession because he won't have it, put up against the door and say, I'm giving you my soul. Leave me my name. So name is the thing that we ultimately identify with. Yeah, and I think the Galbergs, both of them have kind of lost track of who they yeah. are in many ways. Um, you know, it, it, Philip, Philip is kind of so, so caught up in hating himself that he's kind of lost touch with everything, whereas Sylvia, I think, has been so empathetic over the years. So, as she says, you know, I, I, you know, I'm here for everybody except me. She's kind of forgotten who she is, and that's something I think this play is leading to her to, this, to rediscovering in a sense. I get feeling when she, when she rises at the close of this play, you, you get the sense that Sylvia has suddenly remembered who she is, and she's kind of rising to claim herself. You know, I'm, I'm Sylvia Gilbert. I'm not just a Jewish woman, I'm Sylvia Gilbert specifically. Obviously, this question of identity, I mean, Miller himself was a Jew, a Jewish American writer, and um, depending on how you look at his work, it could be argued that this is the first play, 50 years into his career, where he really is dealing overtly with the theme of Jewish identity. Uh, although he does in other plays, like in can I argue with you about that? <laughs> I, love, I, I would love to have an argument. <laughs> but I mean, lots and lots, lots more Jewish themes in plays. No, no, I think there's a lot of Jewish themes. I'm saying I think it could an argument made. This is the play that the, the first play that it was overtly the subject of the play. Like, obviously, playing for time set in Auschwitz. 1918? Right. That's kind of pretty Jewish. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, I'm not familiar with that title, but regardless, I'm just wondering if um, if Miller sort of, I mean, what does it mean to Miller in a way to be a Jewish writer and to be, uh, to be wrestling with this in 1994, 50 years after his, almost 50 years after his first primary success? I think certainly in the beginning part of his career, we don't, oh, we didn't always see him as overtly working out Jewish themes and identities. I mean, they are there in Crucible. They are there in Death of Salesman. And, and well, they seem more subterranean in a right. way. Right. Because, 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 of course, that, though, right. because of, you know, when he first started trying to get a play put on Broadway and was sending out the script, the producer said, sorry, we can't do it, it's too Jewish. So that so that's a question. I mean, I did not know. So he actually met sort of resistance. When he was student, for, he sent out, so what was it called? The, uh, they, it was the rewrite of that. He said, the grass still grows. He sent it out to Jewish producers <laughs> on Broadway, and they said, "No, we really, it's too Jewish. We, it's not going to work." Which is one reason why that you know he started to write those early Broadway plays. Man who had all the luck and all my sons were deliberately sort of set in the Midwest. Couldn't possibly be accused of being Jewish. <laughs> but, but, then, yeah. but then in '94 he wrote uh, after the fall. Which of course is a 64, I'm sorry, uh, known as the famous Marilyn play, which is really not about her as much as we think. But that, that's the first time he overtly has I mean, the Holocaust, the, the tower as a background 
on the stage, uh, uh, on the set in that play. It was because he wrote it in Vichy uh, 11 months later in the play for time in 1980. But this, this play does, I think, in a sense, deal with the first time a Jewish character is so overtly looking overtly. for his or her yeah. Jewish identity. And I, I think that does connect with, with Miller. Now, Miller called himself a secular Jew, a Jewish atheist, whatever. But he, uh, and in a sense, he was searching for that himself. Yeah. And, and Gelber, oh, I was going to say, Gelber has this speech where he says, you know, there are times that I wish I could just be in the shul and... Uh, exactly. I forget the phrase he uses, but something like a full-time Jew or something. Yeah. And, and I, is there not some connection to Miller's... Um, I remember you telling me the story when we were shooting a video for this production yeah. um, about this idea of like struggling with the notion of wanting to sort of fully immerse oneself in one's roots and at the same time wanting to run away from it as yeah, far I as think possible. That is, yeah, I think that's working in Miller and I think yeah. you'll see the nice characters, but I think that's, that's essentially a Jewish experience. We're talking about being uh, Americans, but Jews, as I said, are they Chinese Jews? I mean, the sense of to identify Jews with particular nations, we don't really do that. Except for Israel, but Israel is just founded in the, you know, after the war. So that whole sense of what is a Jew, what makes Jewish identity, I think, is the, the struggle of of this play, mm -hmm. finding yourself. I think I think Miller. Uh, yeah, let's face it. Miller also is is getting older when he's writing this play, and I think we all spend we we reach a point in our in our lives where I think we start to think more seriously about religion and you know, isn't it what's it that my husband's always joking about you know, when he gets to be around maybe seventy he'll automatically be able to speak Yiddish. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you get old when you're Jewish. <laughs> but the other thing that's amazing about this play and uh, so I reverse when you talk about Miller's making political statements. Uh, this play is about paralysis, obviously it's about Sylvia's literal paralysis. But she's paralyzed because of, as Miller said, uh, he blatantly wanted to show uh, the failure of the Western world, of the Allies, uh, uh, our paralysis to stop Hitler. Uh, this play takes place in 1938. Uh, there was a lot more atrocities going on in and we knew it, and we did nothing. And he said when this play was he wrote in 93 and then produced in 94 for Broadway, he wanted to write the play to make a message about, again, the Western world's paralysis going on at that time in the atrocities in Bosnia, the former Rwanda. Yugoslavia, in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We did nothing. And then, now 20 years later, we're here, and we're remembering Sylvia perhaps crying out, where's Roosevelt, where's Churchill, and we're all looking at the same immigration crisis in Europe caused by Syria, and at least I want to say, you know, where's Obama, and where's Angela Merkel, and where's David Cameron? So, well, Merkel's well, actually well, the well, one she person who's stepping something. up and doing something. She stepped up big time, right? Yeah. Uh, so the same, that, that's what makes Miller so important. We come back to his plays, just like we come back right. to Shakespeare. He is Brooklyn Shakespeare, of course, and 100 years from now. Interestingly enough, the whole American posture in the world has radically altered since 1938. I mean, yeah. the, 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 the essential posture in terms of foreign affairs was isolationism, and then basically after the war, the United States <coughs> seemed to have their hands all over every part of the globe, and yet the central issue of the play doesn't sort of seem to have changed. In terms of sitting on our hands when... I mean, Miller's, Miller, I mean, Miller is dealing with that not just on, you know, political, the, you know, the, the national political level, too. He, saw, he, he really means it on a very individual basis. He wrote um, a really interesting uh, piece for the New York Herald Tribune back in 63, um, after he'd been at, I think it was the Nuremberg, uh, he'd been looking at it, the Nuremberg trials, and it's called Our Guilt for the World's Evil. And it was obviously dealing with the Holocaust, but it was very much dealing with this idea that, you know, anybody, if anything, if anything is bad occurring in society around you, and you don't actively do something to stop it, then you are complicit in doing that evil. And, and that was something he very strongly believed in. This is why I think his plays are so outspoken to try and get that message across. But this idea of um, you know, passive guilt is, is useless. You have to actually get up, get up off your ass and do something to change the world. And, and you know, he, he himself, I think, tried, um, you know, especially in the 60s, 70s, he got out there, he was very active with the uh, PAN organization, um, trying, you know, going around the world trying to uh, help other artists who were being banned in their countries and were being imprisoned. And he tried to do something himself, I think. He, he didn't just sit 
back in Connecticut and you know, keep quiet about things. And people don't uh, remember that Miller was a Democratic delegate uh, in the 1968 72 Democratic conventions. Mm -hmm. He really was active. He was kind of reluctantly, yeah. uh, reluctantly elected. And when he actually got there, he suddenly realized, you know, he shouldn't have been so complacent. It really was important to do this kind of thing, to step up. Mm -hmm. And I know George McGovern gave a very moving tribute to him at his memorial service. Uh, you mentioned not sitting back in Connecticut, and of course, when we're talking about geography, that's the that's the other thing we need to talk about is his connections to Connecticut, which are long and, and deep. Um, uh, moved up here in 47, 48? Yeah, yeah, with proceeds from all my sons. Yeah, so um, so in you know more than half his life spent in Connecticut. Is there some argument to be made for Connecticut being important to him as a writer in the way that Brooklyn was? I'm, I'm going to answer it this way. I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> because I think Miller struggled, just like Biff Lohman does in Death of a Salesman, with where do I belong in the country? Where do I belong in the city? And at the very end of Time Bends, at somewhere on the last page, he talks about I've been living here in Connecticut for over 40 years, uh, but I still feel like my attraction is to the city where everything is going on. So he felt that's true. Well, he always get that, he always get that yeah, suite at the Chelsea Hotel. Yeah, that's true. And yet, you know, there's, there's elements, I mean, I think about the fact that he built the cabin that yeah. he wrote up to the salesman in <laughs> with his own hands. Um, I think Mark has a letter in our program where he speaks about going up to Miller's farm and Miller sort of going out on the tractor to yeah, produce trees. Yeah, I mean, it, so there was an element of him that yeah. seemed very much comfortable with the country and... Well, all that, he, he was a carpenter too. Right. He built tables and he planted 5,000 trees uh -huh. on that property in Roxbury when he first bought it. And is, is that sort of sense of the pastoral and the rural, and is that important to... I mean, I don't see it personally in a play like Broken Glass, other than Hyman's mm -hmm. sense of what it means to ride down Ocean Parkway, but I'm wondering if... I don't know if there's a, a, a kind of a tension in Miller between the urban and the rural at all. Mm, I, th I think there is. It, I don't think I don't see it in Broken Glass no, particularly, right. apart from those little moments of, of Hyman and his riding boots. But uh, uh, I mean, there are. I mean, this uh, one of our colleagues wrote a wonderful, a wonderful essay once on on the, the way in which Miller just uses wood in the plays, yeah. and references to wood and how wood is used in the plays as, as a sort of an emblem of the natural world, and how that's often placed in the plays against. Uh, the more urban activities. And, and, it, and it is there in a lot of the plays. I, I just don't, maybe I'll, if I keep looking, I'll find it in Broken Glass, but so far I don't really see it. Mm -hmm. so, to a certain extent, one felt in, uh, in Right Down Mount Morgan, yeah, where you would see that character living in the city and having a double life and another wife. A total double life, right. <laughs> total it's like double he, life. he has the dream. It's like he yeah. can be both. He can be yeah. living in the country and in the city. And there's uh, recollection scenes in that play where, the hunting scenes, where he goes back to be the macho man back in the natural world. So I, you see that working out? No. Um, you know, you mentioned this idea earlier, Sue, about the notion of Miller's really about the conflict between love and success. Uh, how is that embodied in the plays? In other words, how is that conflict manifested? Is it usually an individual in conflict with, I mean, here it's a husband and wife. Is it, is it, is it mostly that sort of domestic and marital relationships where you see this conflict between love and success, or does it manifest itself in other ways? I mean, I'm thinking, Death of a Salesman, All My Sons, The Crucible, they all have a marriage at the center of them. Uh, how important is that to Miller's vision? Well, uh, Miller talked about uh, a sort of uh, circle's responsibility that we all have in our lives. Uh, we have a responsibility to ourself, and we have a responsibility to our families, and we have a responsibility to our societies. And in many Miller's plays, there's a tension and an overlap between all of those, and that's also connected to what always happens in Miller's plays, this tension between public and private. So how much yourself and your family overlap with the social is the tension between public and private. And those things can either be resolved or they can end up uh, in tragedy. Uh, Joe Keller, in those first great hit, uh, All My Sons, uh, his failure was that he didn't realize he had any duty to society when he ordered the manufacture of defective airplane parts. Uh, and he thought he was doing it for his business, and he thought he was doing his, 
his sons, but he comes to realize that all those soldiers are his sons too. And unable to bear it, he kills himself. That's his tragedy. Now, that, that is another very interesting yeah. marriage in that play. Yeah. It's very, it's very I, I'm always interested to see how productions play the wife's role in that Kate Keller, because she has such deep-seated loathing for her husband, for what he's done in many ways. Because even though she knows the play, playing parts he was creating weren't, weren't in her son's play, she kind of knows that he was somehow responsible, morally responsible. And you know, she even she's even the one who sort of kind of gives the game away at, at the the dinner with George, the lawyer who's come to visit them, uh, and sort of blurts out the fact that he wasn't sick when that's how he got away with the saying he wasn't at work the day the parts had been shipped. Um, so it's kind of interesting. That there are a lot of marriages, I think, in Miller plays where where the couple are at odds with each other. There's also rather interesting, interestingly, a lot of triangles, love triangles. Mm. I mean, we have that here, obviously, with the doctor coming in uh, and confused. And we have the you know, tr love triangle in, in Crucible with young Abigail in there. We have the love triangle in View from a Bridge where Eddie Carbone kind of has this uh, feelings for his niece as well as his wife. And you know, it's that these triangle situations, obviously, we, you know, we have that in Miller's own yeah, personal yeah. life. Yeah. <laughs> he's, you know, time. When he's got Mary and kids on one hand and Marilyn trying to date him on the other. I mean, who can say no to Marilyn? Oh. <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> he couldn't. And she appears in so many plays after the 60s. Uh, Sue's talking about all these uh, uh, female characters. Miller had the reputation of being a male playwright who was interested in exploring relationships between fathers and sons and male characters. But uh, the criticism is uh, going quite the opposite direction uh, in those days. And, and Many of the female characters in this play have a power uh, that we just didn't realize before. I mean, Sue's talking about Kate Keller in, uh, in All My Sons. I, the thing that I think is so fascinating about this play that we've just seen, Broken Glass, for me, it's the first Miller play where, where the, the female character, where Sylvia is the focus of the play, everything. The bed is at the center of the play, Morales is in the center of the play, and even though Miller's bent was to originally call the play Gelberg, man and the black man in black, is this is about the woman. There's no doubt about that, I, I, for me. Because the desire to be perfect is always there. But not necessarily to be perfect, but to be afraid. To go through life full of fear. Fully. That's what Gelberg, Gelberg basically says. I've gone through my yeah. whole life full of fear. Fear of myself, fear of my face, fear of the other people yeah. around me. I'm just wondering, that is that. I think it depends on the play. I am what, and the character's awareness of it. I mean, Willie Loman, uh, he says at the beginning of the play, I have such thoughts, I have such thoughts. He, he, he fears what's happening. And think about, I mean, Willie Loman, I don't know whether you know this, uh, I mean, a lot of people like to look at the Willie Loman character and think, oh, his name is Willie Loman. <laughs> that is, actually didn't occur to Miller when he named the character. He actually got the name for that character from a movie that he'd been watching, The Testament of Dr. Mabuse which is kind of a film noir, rather interestingly. And uh, there's one of the characters thinks he's thinks this guy's following him, and he goes into a dark office, and the phone starts going, and he picks up the phone, and he thinks it's this guy, Loman, L-O-H-M-A-N-N, -N, and starts yelling at the phone, Loman, 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 in fear, because he's not sure who this guy, and it's this moment of existential fear. And that's what he chose to name the central character for, for mm -hmm. Death of the Salesman, Willie Loman. So I think, I think there is maybe something about fear going through the place from time to time. Yeah, well, it seems connected to this quest for success, because in a society where you always feel like if you're not on top, you're on your way to the bottom, uh, it's easy to go around feeling fearful. Yeah. Sorry, you were just no, I was saying, in, in a character like Eddie Carbone, uh, talking about conflict, he is unaware and can't explain the passion that just invades him First for his niece, and then to in retribution for his, his niece's lover, and his because his, as you said, the human, mm -hmm. he, it just happens to him. A, a madness, a passion invades him. Madness and passion invades many of us, and you can't explain why. We're just genetically coded sometimes for that to happen, and our shock as and human beings is to be in fear and awe of that when we watch the trajectory of the downfall of the character. 
Um, I want to turn to just questions of form for a second. Is there a way, obviously there's certain um, themes and ideas that Miller was interested in throughout his entire life. Is there a way formally that Broken Glass can be identified as a late play? I mean, it is a late play. It's in the last 10 years of his, of his career and life. Um, how had his writing evolved over the years? If it did indeed, I don't know. And his plays, his plays in, in the 70s and 80s tend, tend to be very different. I mean, if you, if you, they're very rarely produced, sadly, but if they are, you'll find they're kind of different. The, you know, the, he was trying all sorts of different things. A lot of them are very uh, LJ, very sort of simple, uh, representational, with sort of ghost figures and symbolic characterizations. Some of them, I mean, he did this huge uh, sort of musical, spectacular thing called American Clock with song and dance. He did, uh, he wrote, you know, he rewrote Genesis, the creation of the world of the business as a comedy. Uh, and then he rewrote it up, up from Paris with music for which he wrote some little libretto, and uh, he tried all kinds of stuff, kind of interesting things, and it seems as though none of it, none of it people really liked very much, none of it was very successful, and, and many people felt that, that for Broken Glass at least, it was kind of, he was coming back mm. in many ways to some of the tropes he'd used early in the 50s and 60s. And, it, and, it, and not that So it, this is in a way a return to this, okay. And I see it as a return. I'm very interested in the language. We talked about this earlier. I'm very interested in the language of Miller's plays. Uh, not enough uh, uh, critics and scholars looked at his language. They didn't find it quite any interesting. We had this split. Tennessee Williams was the poet of the uh, uh, American playwrights. And Miller used the common man's language. But um, when you go back and reread Miller, and think about, Sue talked earlier about some of the wood tropes in language. Miller uses the common man's language, but he uses imagery and similes and metaphors and cliches that he assigns new language to. So when Willie Loman talks about the woods are burning, the ashes, that's all over that play. This play, uh, we turn to it, and there's image, images of babies five or six times in the play. The sea, uh, uh, Dr. Hyman riding on, and he's there, he's there as chaps for you uh, on the stage. He's talking about the riding, the riding turns, uh, turns sexual. Millie uses the names of characters uh, for symbolic meaning. Let's face it, Dr. Uh, the title, uh, the title itself is, is imagery. And of course, you know, Dr. Hyman, uh, the guy's a stud and he names him Hyman. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so he's, I'm interested in this like place, and he got, it's all over. It's all of, and you reread the crucible, hot, uh, language of opposites, heat and cold, dark and light. It's all over the place. Mm. I want to talk a little bit about Miller's influences. I know there are certain, um, certain things that loom large in his imagination. So I'm just going to sort of name them, and uh, hopefully either one or the both of you can explicate the importance of the Great Depression to forming Miller as an artist. Um, in a way, yeah, can't be overstated. So can you share with us a little bit what is that influence and, and why? I mean, his life was totally up, upended. You know, they're living in, in fairly reasonable splendor in Manhattan, and you know, his father had a chauffeur, mother of fur coats, grand piano, and suddenly that all got taken away, and he doesn't even know if he's going to be able to go to college. And was it taken away by the crash? Or? By the crash, yeah. I mean, his father's business had been doing, had been slowing in, in 28, and they actually moved up to Brooklyn in 28 before the crash. But uh, his father, his father was a very generous businessman. He tried to pay back his debts. He also had taken on a lot of uh, his, his wife's uh, uh, sister's husbands onto the business when he really should have been firing rather than hiring. And so the business really sort of fell, fell apart and they really didn't have a lot of money. Grandpa came to live with them. Miller was basically sharing a pull-out bed in the living room with grand a grandpa he didn't really get on very well with. And and, I, and it, he, you know, he just realized, you know, this was, this kind of told him that you can't necessarily just think that everything's going to go along normally. You can at any moment have the rug totally pulled up, pulled out from under your feet. But you have to kind of live with that expectation in some ways. Um, I mean, he, he kind of, he talks about, he talks about the depression a lot in, um, in, in American Clock. 
where he talked about you know a clock on, on American civilization that's always running and at some and at some point and you know, at some point it can stop and then you kind of have to reboot and start again. Um, but he felt he felt that in many ways one of the things that got Americans through the depression. I mean, he says you know a lot of the stories about everyone pulling together. In eh, some places, yes, but not always. It wasn't as it wasn't as friendly as some people seem to think it was. But uh, but he felt that was a, there was an optimism at heart. There was some kind of optimism in the American democratic spirit that kind of helped pull through. And, and that was what he tried to, I think, draw on in a, in a lot of his work. Um, I, mean, he, I mean, he chose to write a lot of tragedies, which you might say, oh, what a downer. But I mean, for, tra for, for him, tragedy was the most optimistic form of playwriting. Because at the end, end of a tragedy, you are shown mankind at its best. The tragic hero is the person being the best person they can possibly be. And what can be more optimistic than that? Um, you know, I think, I think the, the Greeks had the comedy masks the wrong way around. I think the tragedy is the smiling one. The downturn is comedy, because horrible things happen in comedies. <laughs> well, we all have a good time. Well, we all have a good time. Yeah, I just wanted to ask yeah. something about, because you about tragedy. Uh, Miller redefined the notion of the way we see the tragic hero in, in the 20th century. And he said uh, that the tragic hero, when we see him uh, react against an assault on his dignity and it try to achieve some sense of self against the assault on your dignity, that is tragedy. And I think that came out of his experience in the Depression. He saw the dignity of the individual, the dignity of, of the American society assaulted. And how we challenge that is can be a It's interesting thinking of that I said he wrote tragedy in the common man and, and this being very much uh, politically very important to him that he wants to affect change and it makes me think of I can't source who it was but it was in the New York Times it was a, a, an opinion piece uh, during the Mike Nichols Philip Seymour Hoffman revival of Death of the Salesman in which they essentially compared what the ticket price was for a premier uh, orchestra seat to the 1949 production of Death of a Salesman versus the um, median income of someone in 1949 and the premium seat at that production in 2012, I think it was, 2013 maybe, uh, versus median income. And of course, the price of the seat had gone into the stratosphere and nobody could, could claim to be a common man. <laughs> Could be sitting in that seat anymore. Um, that's the tragedy. Yeah, that's the tragedy. <laughs> well, well, Miller did. I mean, the last 20, 30 years of his life, uh, he railed against that creeping commercialization, uh, particularly of Broadway, that made it difficult. And he was always for campaigning for subsidized theater. Yeah, I mean, for dramas. America's the only nation that doesn't yeah, do it. Yeah, only nation. And he he knew that. He knew that. Uh, Although I want to point out the irony that his estate keeps very firm control over all those productions <laughs> that are the right way. But uh, you're right. Yeah. He, he knows that he, he knew he knew that musicals, the Disneyfication of Broadway, is what kept Broadway going. And now, and he knew that sort of towards the end of his life, that the, one of the only ways to really get great dramas like Miller's and Williams and all the on the stage now is to have a star right. in the show. And of course, like many of the writers from the 40s, 50s, and 60s who lived into the 70s, 80s, 90s, wound up premiering most of their work in the not-for-profit theater, not premiering on Broadway That's anymore. I mean, it's yeah. Broken Glass premiered at Long York, yeah. uh, just up the road. Right. So, um, We're talking about this question of major influences. We talked about the Depression. What about the Holocaust? Where does that fit into uh, Miller's sensibility as a writer? Well, it's, it's, it's both his sensibility as a writer, but also obviously his sensibility as a Jew. I mean, you cannot, I think, you cannot sort of put the Holocaust anywhere aside if you're Jewish. Uh, it is such a looming, looming historical moment, uh, an event, that kind of really redefined what, what, you know, the banality of evil, what people can do to people, and gave, gave us something that really, we really needed to work out what to do about that if we, have, if we want to have any, any future for mankind, I think. And yet he doesn't deal with it overtly, to my knowledge, until the middle 1960s. Well, I, I, well you know, he dealt, I mean, he had, he, he, in 1945, he wrote a novel 
um, all about anti-Semitism and he focus. actually focus, focus in which yeah which I think you screen the film yeah. didn't you as part of the thing I mean in that they, he actually has scenes where where people are drawing swastikas on tombstones in the cemetery um, and you know he's addressing the, you know he's addressing anti-Semitism and I mean obviously it's it, he's writing this in forty five. No, nobody is really writing much about the Holocaust until probably the 60s. Um, he actually makes some comment, I think, in Focus, and also, um, you know, in 1964, after the fall, has, you know, the, the concentration camp tower in the back, it has the characters actually visiting, um, I think it's the Mathausen death camp, um, as one of the scenes in the play, and discussing the central character in that play, Quentin, talks about how you know his his how he connects to the people who are in those camps, both as the inmates and as the people you know as the the, the Nazi soldiers who were who were there as well, and um, and there, there are a lot of there are a lot of I think Holocaust references in in quite a few places. I mean the, the 1981 maybe it was actually it was one he wrote for TV, so it wasn't it was actually done on stage later, but originally he wrote it for TV based on Fania Fellon's uh, memoirs of playing in the orchestra of Auschwitz. And, uh, and that very much deals with the issues of uh, how could the Holocaust have happened. Uh, and some of, that, some of that dialogue you get with um, the doctor in this place about how could, how could those civilized Germans have done such a thing. And he, he deals with that, I think, in plenty of time as well. I think uh, not enough credit goes to Miller's uh, third wife, Inga Marath, uh, for his view on the Holocaust. I mean, they married well, him. Well, she took him. She yeah, took, she him, took him, him there, that's right, yeah. Uh, in 62, uh, in Inga lived in Austria and Germany uh, and was in a work camp uh, for a while, so. Uh, she refused to join the Nazi she Youth refused to join. She wasn't Jewish. She, but she refused to join, and so when they got married, she took him to Europe, and they visited those places, and she was with him when he covered uh, the Nazi war crimes uh, in, in, in Frankfurt, so I think she, she opened his world view, and it, I think it's no coincidence. In '64, he wrote those two Holocaust plays after the fall, and, and, it's, right, and, she, and she, yeah, she gave him more of an international perspective. Perspective, I think. So, talking about events that have influenced Miller, what about the writers who've influenced him? If, if um, you know, we could take X-ray specs and look into Broken Glass or look into Death of a Salesman. We, are we seeing the DNA of other writers in there, the people who came before him? Who are those writers? We've talked about Clifford O'Dell. Well, we've got Clifford O'Dell is the poet. The, you know, the, the poet. Right, yeah, yeah, the person who writes the poet. Yeah. Tennessee Williams. Obviously, I mean, they're, they're close in age. Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, and Tennessee Williams and Miller both used um, Elliot Kazan as the director for the early plays. And Elliot Kazan, before he gave names, was very buddy buddies with Arthur Miller. They were almost like brothers. And you know, he took him. He took him to you know the tryouts of Streetcar. And said, what do you think of this play? What do you think? And and Miller was absolutely amazed. He couldn't believe what he was seeing on stage. He thought this is the best thing I've ever seen on stage. And you know, Streetcar. If you, if you know the play, you know, it has a lot of sort of this sort of. Uh, Imagistic sort of surround, you know, it's in steamy New Orleans, but we have sort of characters wandering, wandering past, singing flowers to the dead. We have the sounds of waltzes and trains crashing through. We have all kinds of, uh, you know, it's, we're not talking realism here. And and Miller Miller sort of saw this as an opportunity to create something interesting and different. And really, I think it's watching Streetcar that gave him the idea for, for sailing. Yeah, I think the, the quote he said in Sign Pants, he says. Streetcar, uh, when he saw Streetcar, he said, Tennessee Williams gave me the license to speak full throat. He just unleashed the power uh, in Miller, but he never realized uh, he had. It's interesting because, of course, Miller, for good or for ill, what, what is always thought of him is he's this great American naturalist. But you think of a play like uh, Death of a Salesman, it's very expressionistic in its way, you know, characters that seem to only exist inside Willie's head keep making well, well, it. Yeah, that first title, the, the, the inside of his head. Right. I and mean, he really wanted to try and get this sense of the simultaneity, what's going on inside a person's head. I mean, the whole play is really just Willie's play. And he's trying to give you a sense of what is going on physically in, in Willie's world, but also mentally at the same time. And I'm not sure it's always successful. I think he does that more successfully in After the Fall, where he kind of does the same kind of thing with the central character, Quentin. And I think in that play, he actually gets across, it really does feel like the inside of his head. Whereas 
a lot of times when people watch salesmen, they're always having flashbacks, and they're not quite sure what they're saying. A lot depends on the staging, I think. Um, I want to ask, and I want to make sure we have time for, for audience questions, but both of you as fierce partisans, <laughs> Arthur Miller, the work of Arthur Miller, uh, I wonder if you have any opinions about either what are the essential, an essential question, or a couple of essential questions you should be asking about Miller that people never do, or one or two things about Miller that almost everybody always gets wrong. I don't mean factual things, but just the way the work is seen. I, th I think we need to acknowledge the fact that Miller could be very funny. Yes. And I think a lot, I mean, I, I know- His he work or as, a, or as a man? Oh, both. Oh, okay. Apparently he was, he was like the ideal dinner party yeah. conversationalist. Uh, apparently he was very charming. Uh, but his plays, I mean, I have never sat through, it doesn't matter which play, however, you know, deep a tragedy is supposed to be, Paul's plays actually have some very funny moments. I mean, you will laugh through a bunch of, uh, things in this play, and it's a very dark, sad play, but there's a lot of humor in it as well. And I think, I think, uh, and he tried his hand at writing some comedies. <coughs> People just like, oh, Arthur Miller can't write comedies, we can't like this play, it's not an Arthur Miller play. But I, I think, I think we need more acknowledgement of his, his ability to write funny plays. Mm -hmm. Great. Steve, uh, what do you want I, to do that? Miller, all these years, still very often in a lot of circles, has the reputation of being a social realist, and that is there, but in not as many plays as people think. I mean, we were talking about sales. He has so many plays in which he's experimenting with form. The Death of Sales was experimenting in form, uh, where he'll use an, an outside narrator, uh, like, in a, like in, a, in a View from the Bridge. You borrow that from Thornton Wilder and, and, and Tennessee Williams. After the Fall takes place uh, a lot in the mind of Quentin. He has a play, uh, Mr. Peter's Connection, a very late play, 1998. He says the, the entire play takes place in the mind and memory of, of Mr. Peter's, at the place between the time you wake up and sleep. So that's where the play takes place. So he's interested in those kinds of memory plays, those kinds of senses of when, as he says in the title of his autobiography, where time bends for us. Uh, well, I have a question about one of the conflicts in the play, but I also, just as an aside about the name, I did used to always think that the early romance was low man, and that was sort of affirmed for me because the doctor is high man. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. right. But in terms of the conflict, the pro conflict of paralysis, we have Sylvia just tearing the hair out of her head that the Jews won't stand up and leave Germany. But she's also punishing herself that she won't stand up and walk out of her marriage mm -hmm. and, and that she still can't, even today, 20 years later. But I'm also wondering if Miller wasn't beating himself up a little bit because he, uh, in terms of the conflict of success in the American theater, he submitted plays about Judaism and he was told they were too Jewish. So he kept quiet for a long time before he finally put this play out there. So that's some of him being paralyzed mm -hmm. and not stepping forward. For those who might not have heard of the balcony, she's essentially asking, if I can condense the question to, about this connection between the microcosm and the macrocosm, so that Sylvia is her paralysis. She says, why can't these people get up and leave? Why can't we do something? And yet she fails to do something about her own marriage. Um, and then uh, she's also speculating, is, is Miller himself sort of, uh, is, is this something castigating the self because of his submitting plays early on in his career and being told they're too Jewish and so making that sort of subterranean for so many decades. I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that. I, I mean, the death, death of the salesman to me seems so Jewish in so many ways. I mean, they're, they're currently, they're just opening in New York, the Yiddish version again. They're, they're re, re, revisiting that. And the characters, a lot of the, 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 the language, the ver verbal, you know, the verbal sort of twi swi switching around of phrase and the colloquialisms, it seems, it seems to me the but characters what about are this, really Jewish. What about this issue of the... I mean, by 49, he was a big enough right. person, he didn't have to worry so much. But what about this issue of the microcosm and the macrocosm? In other words, mm -hmm. taking up a large political problem yeah. and looking at it in the political sphere, at the same time looking at a small, excuse me, a smaller mm -hmm. version of that problem in the domestic sphere. Oh, yeah, Is that the usual for Miller? Yeah. Oh, I, I think... Yes, because you very often see where the, the individual, the self, 
is connecting to places outside and beyond the place where they live. I mentioned that uh, Eddie Carbone in A View from the Bridge. His pat uh, Alfieri tells us, Alfieri's an out outside narrator in that play, and he, he tells us that Eddie is filled with this passion that we talked about earlier, this passion that harkens back to his Sicilian roots, and uh, he doesn't he, he doesn't under, he doesn't understand it. Uh, he's here. He doesn't understand. He's Eddie is totally disconnected with his Sicilian American roots, but he prides himself on being a Sicilian living in Brooklyn. Uh, so he he just he's completely disconnected, and that that you see that very often uh, with Miller, with the character connecting to something outside them not able to connect with it or not being conscious of it. I mean, the, the, I mean, the actual close of this play is incredibly ambiguous. Yes. Uh, and you know, Miller had a lot of trouble trying to decide how he wanted to end it. Uh, and there's, diff there's even different published versions where there's somewhere he actually says, Philip dies. And then there's, and then there's Philip falls back unconscious. I'm, I'm not sure the paralysis yeah. in this play is Miller's paralysis. I think it's a paralysis. I, I think all of the characters in this play, even though they can be believable as human beings, I think they are very uh, representational. It is a very representational. It's an allegory. It is yeah, an allegory. Of sorts, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Which is like what his very first play was, yeah. The Man Who Had All the Luck. Well, I've heard this interesting story, you know, it's thinking about this idea of the cult of success and the, and the sense of fear that we all have as human beings of him agonizing over uh, uh, reviews of the original production and, and somebody who didn't say this to him, presumably, but just thought, you're Arthur Miller. Why do you care at this point in your life <laughs> right, yeah. what critics yeah. have to say? Yeah, he could have stopped writing after death of a salesman and lived comfortably for the rest right. of his life. He did complain. I mean, he's Arthur Miller, but he did complain once he said, uh, I managed to have this career without having one New York critic in my corner. <laughs> oh, read from the author. Which oh, is not exactly <laughs> accurate. <laughs> um, we have time for a few more questions. Um, yes, sir, in the honor. Um, the elephant in the room. Uh, what, what both uh, in his writings and uh, in his personal involvement was his relationship with Marilyn Monroe affecting him? Uh, I think we probably will be here another five hours. <laughs> <laughs> so what's so what I, mean, I, mean, I mean, he was he was deeply in love with her, uh, like the rest of the nation, yeah. uh, for whatever reason. <laughs> yeah. Of course, the rest and of the nation the, was in love with an image, not and, a real person. And the, fact that, and the fact that then he lost her, she divorced him and ran off and then died, and he didn't go to the funeral because he didn't want to get involved in the circus, he kind of got punished by America for like turning, turning his back on Monroe and then exposing her in After the Fall, which seems to me a fairly kind exposure, because I think the character of Maggie in After the Fall is a very sympathetic portrayal, yeah. uh, given, given the complexity of Monroe. Um, but he, he locked, you see go, the ghost of, of Marilyn in all the plays pretty much after that. This one, there, maybe not. I don't know. This one? Maybe not. Uh, this but might it, be one, this one. She's there, maybe, she, yeah. she's there in the later plays, and she's there in uh, Mr. Peter's Connection, and she's there uh, in the very last play that Miller wrote. Uh, finishing the picture. Finishing the picture. Which he which just write until after yeah, Abel and Grouth had passed. But he, he wrote that play about a starlet who had difficulty finishing a film, which is all about her difficulty that finishing the misfits. That play is about thinly veiled yeah. as you possibly <laughs> right, did. Right, exactly. Um, and that was his last play, so he finished the picture. I mean, I don't, I don't think his, his marriage to Marilyn affected it. I, I mean, there, there, are, there are some sort of people who talk about, oh, he didn't write when he was married to Marilyn. Uh, which was not true, actually. He, you know, he was working on *The Beautiful Bridge*. He also wrote a, a tremendously um, long <laughs> uh, introduction to his collected plays, yes. which is a really seminal theatrical. Although you essay. do look at when they list, you know, go to artwiller.org oh. or something, and they're listing the major plays. There is this sizable gap between five and six. She, she did take a look yeah. at that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, did he does talk about time, as he said. He couldn't do as much writing as he wanted to because I had to vote my time to what Marilyn needed. Uh, and he did a lot of strict said. doctoring for yeah. the movies she was in. Yeah. But, um, it, but if, if, if he had not had his relationship with Monroe, there are many works that would not have gotten written because I mean, he, was, he was with her. 
Uh, and I would point out, of, of his three wives, Marilyn was the only one who was Jewish. <laughs> so she converted. She converted and she actually went through fairly lengthy conversion, really. Actually went to his mom to try and find out family recipes so she could cook a nice Jewish meal at home. Uh, yes, sir. Would you, the subject of forgiveness, which is all pervasive in this and three or four of his other plays, uh, I can't help but wonder about his own religiosity and on Yom Kippur and the annual request for forgiveness, pardon my sins, etc. Mm -hmm. How much did religion play a part in Miller's own thinking and coming into his play? You had said he was a, a secular Jew. Secular. That's how you defined him. I mean, he was from Mitzvah. You know, he, he, you know, he, he grew up his family. He, he has memories of going to the Simchat Torah, dancing around synagogue with the, with the Torah scrolls. He, you know, I, and I don't think he ever kind of denied his Jewishness. I, I think it, there's a lot of Jewish things in a lot of his plays. I think probably, if you just look at the sort of, it's a very Old, Te Old Testament Judaic morality in, in, in his plays, the idea of uh, responsibility, yeah. I think is at the heart of the Jewish faith, yeah. this responsibility. Um, you, know, when you, when you, you know, when you're saying, when, when you, you're, well, you're not just saying uh, sorry for yourself, any sins you've done, you're saying sorry for the entire community. And, and this is, and, and that's part of the responsibility to others, the society, the social group, which, which is, it's, you know, it's embedded in the Jewish faith. It's interesting because, of course, he's a lifelong political progressive, but in a way, constitutionally, kind of small c conservative in a sense of responsibility mm -hmm. to others, the ties that bind, communal. Uh, bonding more important than necessarily just um, not that the individual conscience. I mean, he was obviously, um, you know, very keen on the idea of the individual conscience, but that we all exist in relation mm. to each other, well, which is sometimes a message in America that gets distorted. Yeah, two of his favorite sayings were, "The fish is in the water, and the water's in the fish," <laughs> which is basically, you know, you can't can, you can't disconnect the individual from the social mm. milieu that they are. Bonded in some ways, and the other one is the chickens are always, always going home to roost. It's like you know, you know, which is his description of any sure. great play. Any right? great play. Yeah. Yeah. Right, Ibsen. Right. It's, it's, it's all it's about the birds coming home to roost and the chickens coming home to roost, and you know, you can't, you're not going to get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to come back and bite you. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Yeah. As a playwright, how important is he constantly rewriting? Uh, when putting on production. In other words, he starts out with one thing going before the end of the play is It depended on the play. Some plays this were play, I think. This play he spent a, a lot of time. time. He spent yeah. a lot of time rewriting. He who was I think I think it's because he'd been through a period of pretty much being ignored and he, he really wanted to do a play that people would once again like, oh Miller's back, I think. It was always I mean it was always very important to him to be a successful playwright, that meant something to him. He wanted to be successful. And when he was working with uh, Ilya Kazan in the earlier plays, Ilya Kazan was just a powerful director. Uh, and uh, Kazan would, during rehearsals, would, he, he did it to Tennessee Williams also. You have to go back and rewrite the scene, rewrite the scene. So they were very often would be rewriting stuff weeks and days. Uh, before a show would 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 preview, so yeah. I mean, he added he added that whole scene in the Crucible, Crucible right? after Jed Harris left the production because the reviews weren't too good, and so he added a, that a little scene of, of John Proctor meeting Abigail in the woods to try and spice it up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to conclude maybe just talking briefly. Obviously, it's what we've been doing all afternoon, but about Arthur Miller's legacy. Obviously, at 100 is a nice round number, and you start to think about kind of the future. And uh, I know that Miller really very much wanted his writing to change the world. And I couldn't help but reflect in preparation of the afternoon the fact that his enduring appeal in a way would argue against the fact that he's changed the world. The fact that you can go see Death of a Salesman and all of the issues about the relationships between individuals and their families and labor and management, nothing has changed. Um, I mean, it's a testament to his brilliance as a writer, but I guess I wanted to just ask this question about the, the, the real possibility for social change and, and, and Miller's, um, what is Miller's last, uh, what is his last I'm going to say, I'll answer it this way. It depends on what, which particular society at which particular time is going to bring, is going to see the play. So I'll just do that. We go, we go to see Hamlet, which was written in 16, 400 years, in 1600. 
we're as about as different from the Elizabethans as could be. And yet, we have Shakespeare did almost 400 years of fixed change on us from our experience of Hamlin. Uh, with a play like that, and I think that's going to happen with... with, with as individuals or social, socially? I guess I'm talking about social. I think both, okay. because I think they're connected. So it's death, I'll say it with Death of a Salesman, because it's what fascinates about me. I say at the end uh, of my new book, I say, we'll be watching Death of a Salesman 50, 100 years from now. But if you say that play is about the struggle to achieve the American dream, the American dream is going to change in form. It's changed in the 50, 60 years since Miller wrote that play. But yet we're still going to see Willie Loman and Biff Loman right. and Hap Loman. And yet in the 50 years, 60 years, and years since, will, since that play's been written, you could argue that Willie Loman's treated almost kindly compared to the way yes, workers yes, are treated and today. That, and, I that's, mean, and that's where the play opens up to that dialogue. He didn't have to train his own replacement. Right, and that's where the play opens us up to that dialogue, right? <laughs> right. So, well, I mean, Miller did tell Mel Gelsau when he asked, you know, what is your legacy? He said, a few good parts for, go for, for actors. A few yeah. good parts for actors. That's what he said he wanted his legacy. For. Which is great, because I think, I mean, as a, as a concluding statement, he, first and foremost, was a person of the theater. Yes. Absolutely. Loved the theater, yes. knew the theater. He never, yeah, he never yeah. really did the lore for Hollywood. He never yeah. really wanted to do, I mean, he was offered a job in Fox when he graduated college, and he turned it down. He decided he wanted to work for the Federal Theater instead. Mm -hmm. And uh, that didn't last too long because they got shut down. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he did his best. <laughs> Steve, Sue, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Thank you for sticking around.